Let's bring on our guest. This is Dr. G. Weldon Gilcrease. He's the Deputy Director of Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting. And if you have questions as well, leave them in the chat. Um, really, I think it's an important discussion, really important topic. Hey, Doctor, thanks for being here with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's really a pleasure and an honor to, to be on your show, Josh. Yeah, so first off, just briefly tell us about your organization, Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting. Like, what are you, why did you start? What's the, what's the focus? Yeah, so back in 2006, a report came out um, called the Madison Kilgore Report, which essentially followed 33 different evidentiary trails on allegations that the Chinese Communist Party was orchestrating the systematic killing of prisoners of conscience. So these are, you know, innocent people, predominantly Falun Gong practitioners. And essentially these people were being typed as they were put into labor camps, prisons and detention centers and undergoing, they were undergoing torture. And this, this there was actually a, a, a woman who went by the pseudonym Annie, who in the spring of, of 2006 came out and said that her husband, who was a neurosurgeon, had cut the corneas out of two to 3,000 uh, live Falun Gong victims. And <clears throat> so the, as a follow-up, essentially through a series of different events, uh, David Matus and David Kilgore, who were, are Canadians, uh, went about and, and, and uh, tried to follow a lot of the, the, the evidence. And basically what they found was uh, China, which was a country that had no organ donation or distribution system, a country that that sort of culturally uh, believes in this Confucian idea that you 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 bring your body intact into the next life and and so the the body is to stay undisturbed and so there, there it, culturally wasn't wasn't a, a country where where you know like the United States where where donating organs was was a part of it so a country without organ donation or distribution system in the early two thousands coinciding with the persecution the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners. They were suddenly doing, they went from doing, as an example that I often give, 15 to 20 liver transplants per year from 1977 to 1999. In the early 2000s, they were doing two to 3,000 transplants per year without an explanation of where they were coming from. And uh, David Matus and David Kilgore in their report essentially showed that uh, they were killing uh, innocent prisoners of conscience that had been typed and then killing them on demand for organ transplant. And this was all orchestrated by the Chinese Communist Party, but was being carried out in uh, predominantly military hospitals, but also uh, civilian hospitals. And so in 2007, Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting was created really to try to bring attention to this, because as you can imagine, Josh, you know, you're up against this, this, I mean, you're up against one of the most powerful propaganda machines in the world and one of the most powerful uh, countries in the world in the, in, in the Chinese Communist Party. And you're, uh, you know, a, a scrappy group of doctors trying to say we we should do something. So the organization has been around uh, uh, several years ago. We were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and the the idea is to raise awareness, but ultimately to to have action to stop these horrific crimes. Hmm. Now, I want, and now today is July twentieth, and this is the twenty third anniversary, the start of the persecution. Can you explain to us like what happened on July twentieth? Why is this day significant in terms of like human rights? Yeah, it, that's a great question, Josh. And, and I think it really does align with the, the, the story of, of forced organ harvesting. So, you know, I, I kind of give you a background of how China had no organ distribution or donation system. But we know that in 1984, uh, the Chinese Communist Party had passed a regulation essentially making it sort of quasi legal to take an executed criminal and uh, use an executed criminal's organs for transplant. Now, the, the number of executions done is a state secret, so we don't really know uh, how many executions were, were, were being done, but as we saw in the early 2000s, this number was, was dropping. But what happened, it, so in the 1990s, you'll, you, you hear stories about executed criminals' or, organs being taken after they're shot in the chest or in, in, in the head, uh, but this is, uh, you, you hear something very different. So on July 20th of, of 1999, Jiang Zemin, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, um, essentially sets in motion a, a, an illegal ban so the, uh, against Falun Gong practitioners. And if you look at it in 1999, there's 70 to 100 million people practicing Falun Gong, and they're throughout China. They're not geographically located in one specific area of China. They're, 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 they're spread throughout China. 
And so by doing that, when you set in motion, you know, you, you turn Falun Gong practitioners uh, and this is a, you know, this is a spiritual practice that actually resonates with ancient uh, Chinese belief, ancient Chinese medicine, and, and a lot of the traditional beliefs. So it was really bringing a lot of the Chinese people back, not through, you know, fear and intimidation and coercion, but, but through changing people's hearts. And so when, when the Chinese Communist Party uh, and Jiang Zemin specifically set in motion uh, this, this persecution of Falun Gong practitioners, even if you take 1% of that 70 million to 100 million practitioners at any given time, you have hundreds of thousands of innocent, relatively healthy, a lot of younger uh, prisoners of conscience. And what you start hearing in the early 2000s are stories of how as they're being dragged into labor camps and tortured, they're, they're, they're being medically tested before they, they go there. And essentially those medical tests were not to, to check in on their health. I mean, they're, they're undergoing horrific torture, which has been well documented uh, by the UN Special Rapporteur on, on Torture and, and, and a number of different uh, 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 bodies that, that have, have looked at this. So um, July 20th is so important because July 20th in 1999 also coincides in the next two years, you see this explosion, an exponential explosion of transplant activity in China, and you can't do it without human bodies. So that that process beginning in, in in July and you know tomorrow marks the 23rd anniversary of it. That process of dehumanization and demonization of <clears throat> these individuals has to coincide with uh, you know this this explosion in transplants. Just because you really have no other explanation for where you know as I mentioned earlier those those thousands of liver transplants are are, are coming from. Now, I think a lot of people are wondering, too, you know, what is Falun Gong? Because, you know, if you go on like Wikipedia, they, they just say terrible things about it. it. It's hard to differentiate what is propaganda from China and what is the real story. So, I mean, what is Falun Gong and how does that relate to what we see in like a lot of news articles and so on? Yeah. So so Falun Gong is a is a it's a self-cultivation practice of mind and body. I mean, really, it's a again, it really has a lot of ties to, to traditional Chinese thought and traditional Chinese belief like Taoism and Confucianism and, Bo and specifically Buddhism. And it, it, the, I think one of the difficult things is, you know, in the, it, it was first made public in, in 1992 and it was free. It was open to all. It had no membership, which I actually think left the, 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 the group very vulnerable. But by 1999, when there were 70 million to 100 million by Chinese Communist Party numbers, uh, people practicing, again, scattered geographically throughout China, this became a real threat in terms of, of numbers uh, because it was actually more than the roughly 65 million active Chinese Communist Party members. So it had outgrown them, but it's also, you know, it's, it's also really tied to, to traditional, uh, I think, uh, belief in, in China, uh, respect for the divine, respect for one another. This is antithetical to, to uh, Chinese Communist Party ethics. I mean, if you look at their rule, it's rule with an iron fist. If you look at their campaigns of smashing the four olds or old culture, old customs, old history, old ideas, this was to try to uproot and ferret out and essentially destroy all the traditional beliefs and, and traditions of, of uh, you know, a country that had thousands of years of, of history. So the, the way that I look at Falun Gong is it's a self-cultivation practice rooted in the Buddhist school that's centered around basic tenets of truth and compassion and tolerance. And the reason that you see this propaganda sort of parroted on Wikipedia is because I think in the West, we really have no idea what, what the truth is because we've heard such incessant propaganda coming from, and if you really think about it, especially in the modern era with technology, this is the most powerful propaganda tool we have ever seen. I mean, it, it's nothing like what we saw with in, in the 20th century or in the early 1900s, just because you can affect so many more people, you can do it so much more efficiently and effectively. So. It, it is a, a traditional practice. It, it, it really, I think the reason you saw it really go from a standstill in, in, in its first teaching in 1992 to 70 to 100 million people is because it really, it, in my view, it resonated with you know, the, 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 the deep kind of rooted ethics and morals and values of, of traditional uh, uh, China with truth and compassion and tolerance, which I think Josh also brings up an important idea that 
you know, when, with Doctors Against Forced Story and Harvesting, it is not an anti-China organization. The, the Chinese Communist Party isn't really Chinese. It's something that was adopted from the West or, or, or from Eastern Europe or Central Europe. And, and it, it's not really it's not really a party. It's a it's a, it's a single system that has had totalitarian totalitarian rule over the country since it, it initially took power in 1949. Um, and uh, it, it's not even really communist. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's some sort of mutation of, of communism. Hmm. You know, just a few questions from our, from our audience. I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, kind of what this means for the United States. Um, one of our one of our audience members, Lisa Keys eight two two, she's asking, do do organs from China make their way to the U.S. for transplants here? I know of an infant who received a transplant in Tennessee rather quickly and wondered where the transplant heart came from. Are aborted baby hearts being sold as transplants? They're asking basically, organs from the Chinese Communist Party, you know, killing Falun Gong practitioners, are, are those being sent here? How, or, you know, organ, organ uh, what you call tourism, like, how does the kind of relation, how, how does this relate to the United States, in other words? Is there any yeah, kind of overlap? Josh. Yeah, it's funny because I wish I could give you a simple answer and I wish I could give you the data on. I think I think this is one of the real challenges of our organization and really a challenge of me as a, you know, as an academic physician. It's 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 hard. It's first of all, it's hard to get your hands on on those numbers. I, I know at my uh, institution where, uh, you know, where uh, I'm an associate professor of medicine, when I tr have tried to figure out, well, how many patients that we have here that we see in a post transplant setting have gone to china and received an organ we we, we have nothing in our uh, electronic health record that is even a field that would say where the the organ came from it's, it's simply not asked now most organs are, are coming from within our own state in the state of utah but if somebody were to travel to china and receive an unethically sourced organ they're likely there's likely a falun gong practitioner is the most likely but also uyghurs or house christians or political dissidents it's likely that 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 person has been killed on demand uh, for that organ. So to answer, I think it's an excellent question. And I think the bigger question is, how is the United States tied to the, the Chinese Medical Association or Chinese medicine? And one is how, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do uh, and, and one of the things that that, that we're, we're trying to push through is an actu actually a House bill, uh, which is 6319. Uh, called the Falun Gong Protection Act, um, and it's specifically about forced organ harvesting. But I think this is this, one of the specific questions: is how do we know how many Americans have gone? And you can imagine if you're dying of liver failure and you think you only have weeks to live, you know the, the desperation that 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 those those people must be suffering. But to go to to China and and have somebody else essentially slaughtered on demand <clears throat> for that organ. It simply shouldn't be done and should never be done and is really unconscionable. So I, I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you that there's no way that I can even find out from my own institution. I, I work uh, uh, quite a bit in transplant in our own institution. So I know uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot of our transplant surgeons um, and it, there, there's no way to, to, to get at that because there's nothing that, that requires uh, uh, that information if we're doing the aftercare for, for a transplant. The other piece that I want to talk about is the educational piece. I mean, if you have a country that has no organ donation system or organ distribution system like China, and all of a sudden they're doing thousands of transplants, they had to learn how to do their transplants somewhere. And if you actually look at the websites from hospitals in China that were guaranteeing liver transplants in on with an average waiting time of two weeks, right? That's almost impossible unless you have people that you're going to kill on demand. Those same websites, which you can still access on the Wayback Machine, if you have the right URL and you go back to these Chinese hospitals that were doing transplants, you would see average wait times that were, I mean, just impossible without having a, a, a sea of dehuman, dehumanized humanity that, that's waiting to be killed for organs on demand. Um, but they, they, had, they had to learn how to do the transplant somewhere. So a lot of them would, would talk about the surgeons and say, how they had trained in the United States at these various centers that, that were training them. So I think the training piece is also exceptionally uh, and highly problematic as far as complicity. And I think between training uh, uh, and, and having such a close tie with uh, you know, in collaboration with 
the, 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 the Chinese medical systems and Chinese hospitals, I, I think that's highly problematic. And it's, you know, it's nothing, again, this is not, this is not something that's against inherently Chinese physicians or Chinese surgeons or Chinese people. It's actually trying to protect, uh, you know, their, their medical system and their people from these horrific crimes against humanity.